Okay, folks, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Uh, John Cleary teaches languages at a university in Scotland and has previously taught in colleges and universities in Germany, Japan, Malaysia, and the UK. He's been involved in educational development projects and teaching modern European languages, which have led him to travel widely in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. And in a previous life, he also worked in a museum and wrote a history of the people who had built and inhabited medieval almshouses. So, uh, four years ago, since Family Tree DNA introduced their new Y chromosome sequencing test, the Big Y, this talk will review how this popular test has transformed surname projects in this time and how the SNP tsunami has upended and transformed the shape and size of the Y chromosome haplotree. So please give a big warm welcome to John Cleary. And uh, everybody, I'd like to thank you all very much indeed for coming out on this foul day. It's, I just walked across my hotel and it was appalling. If I wasn't uh, coming to speak, I wouldn't come here. So thank you very much indeed for uh, your, your diligence in turning out to hear us and our other speakers today. So all right, I'm going to talk about why chromosome research. And I'd like to say at this point um, that this talk is a follow-up to a talk I gave for beginners using SNP testing in Y chromosome research, which I gave in Birmingham in April, and Norris has made, has made these talks available on the YouTube platform he maintains. So today's talk is not a beginner's talk, so I need to warn you at that stage. Um, I'm looking at a, at a slightly higher level at what you can do with BY, big, big Y results once you have them. So I'm not going to look specifically at projects or surnames today, but we shall look at some tools which are available to use to help make sense of the data you get from the big Y, and I'll then end by reviewing the recent changes in Family Tree DNA's presentation of big Y results. So can I ask you first of all, how many of you have taken a Y test? I know only half the audience can possibly have done so, but um, can I ask um, ladies, Maybe some of you have had arranged Y tests for your male relatives and husbands and so on. Yeah. And how many of you have used the big Y test? Okay, good. So quite a few of you have moved on to SNP testing. And one of the things I uh, would argue, and I think others uh, around would agree with me, is that we've gone as far as we can with STR testing. And that therefore we now need to use uh, SNP testing like the big Y if we're to get meaningful and sensible results in this. So, just to um, go through the uh, initial slides, it's not working. <laughs> All right. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll stand close to the machine then, yeah. Um, just, just then to um, give the context of what I'm going to talk about. The, the big Y, uh, for those who don't know yet, is a next generation sequencing test. That is, it aims to sequence targeted uh, regions of the Y chromosome. Not the whole Y chromosome, you can't read it all, but it aims to target those regions which can be read and can generate good quality results. And rather than simply um, aiming to see what up and down changes that may occur on very limited regions of the Y chromosome, it tries to read long sequences and identify particular mutations on those sequences. Um, it's a discovery test. I mean, the aim of this test is to find new SNPs that were not known before. So I will not be talking today about other forms of SNP testing, such as single SNP tests, some of you may take a <coughs> or SNP pack tests, which again some of you may be talking about. Uh, uh, take. Uh, James Irvin will be talking about these tomorrow, if you can come here at his talk. So, just to um, remind you, what I think most of you know, uh, three types of um, DNA testing used in genealogy, um, which are on the Y chromosome, the mitochondrial DNA, and the autosome chromosomes. And the, the Y DNA allows you to follow the paternal line. The mitochondrial DNA allows you to follow a maternal line, whereas the autosome DNA allows you to follow any line you like, but only as far back as the autosomal DNA can reach, which is generally thought to be around about six or so generations. And the advantage of the Y chromosome is that it does allow you to go back further. So even though it only tracks one line, the farthest, 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 you can go back a lot further. So if you're interested in busting brick walls, 
or um, working out genealogy of your 17th century or medieval ancestors, then autosomal DNA will not do anything for you, but Y chromosome and mitochondrial DNA um, can assist. And just to remind you, I'm sure you're all familiar with these, but um, we, took, we, we throw these abbreviations at people, STR, SNP, and the student will know what they mean. So there are two primary forms of mutation which genealogists track on the Y chromosome. The STRs are what Y chromosome research used to be from the late 1990s until probably um, around a few years ago. And they're still used, but I think they need to be used in tandem with SNP testing. And so the STR, or short tandem repeat, is essentially a repeating chunk of DNA that will repeat a certain number of times. And what we used to do was count the numbers of those repeats. And they go up and down, up and down, up and down, and as a result, to use them is quite a specialised and rather probabilistic thing. On the other hand, yeah, there are the well-known uh, STR surname project charts that some of you are probably very familiar with. Then the SNP, on the other hand, the single nucleotide polymorphism, of a mouthful, that's why we say SNP, um, but the emphasis here is on the single. It's a single point mutation on one particular base or position in the Y chromosome. And here in the diagram, we can see the, the T in the top row has changed to an A and the two down below. So one of these is a SNP. I don't know which one, either it's a T becoming an A or an A becoming a T. But that's what SNPs are. We look for these mutations on the, the chromosome in the belief that, that once they mutate, they stay there. So if one medieval man has a mutation like this, then all of his descendants, in theory, should have that same mutation. And that way you can begin to find people who are related to each other because of these rare uh, mutations which they carry in their family branch line. So that's the uh, SNP there. Um, and just in case you're confused by all these G, C's, A's, and T's, these are the, the bases, which are the, the molecules that form the, the great DNA molecule stuff. So uh, we use this as a shorthand, and again in this business we talk a lot about our A's becoming T's and so on. Um, and again, don't worry about the chemistry underneath, you can read about it if you like, but you don't need to know. You just need to recognise the patterns of these four symbols, C, G, A, and T, how they mutate or use the So, um, I'll give you a little bit of history of the, the Big Y, because it's about four years now since the Big Y was first announced at Family Tree DNA's uh, conference in Houston. And um, they made the announcement they were going to move into um, what they call full Y sequencing. It's never really been full Y, but it doesn't really matter. It's extended uh, Y sequencing. And the first orders were placed during the autumn following. And I think it was around about April the next year, after a short delay, when the first results began to be released. And uh, this then became known as the, the SNP tsunami. It soon became clear that these tests were discovering a lot of SNPs. Far more, I think, than people were expecting when the first orders were placed. Um, and according to Family Tree DNA, um, they now claim to have around about 20,000 big Y results in their database. That's a, ballpark figure, um, of which about 18,500, they say, are uh, customer tests, and another 1,500 are <laughs> academic studies which have used the big Y. Some of these have been published, some not, but they exist in the Family Tree DNA database and can be used for SNP identification. Um, I was trying to find what data I could on other um, analysts and companies who make use of big Y data. Some of you may be familiar with the third-party analyst company Whitehall, um, who will take raw data from Big Y, analyze it for you, and give you a nice, user-friendly, readable interface to look at the results. And Whitehall have about 11,000 or so um, Big Y results in their database. So that's a little bit more than half of the customers who've taken Big Y, have acquired their raw data, and sent it on to Whitehall for further analysis. Um, I was interested too in what kind of chains there may have been uh, across the four years since Big Y was first announced. Family Tree DNA weren't able to tell me, I don't know if they have the data, but they weren't able to uh, let me know that. But again, some of you may know Alex Williamson's Big Tree page. And uh, Alex has a breakdown of the number of BAM files, that's raw results, sent to him across the past four years. And uh, the breakdown here, the ones in blue, are the um, L21, the large RL21 haplogroup, which many of you will probably be members of, I am. 
and it's the most common uh, haplogroup, white haplogroup in Ireland. Um, and as you see in the early days, there was very heavy demand from uh, um, L21 members that were very well organized by their project administrators. And that's remained more or less static across the four years. There's been a big increase in the numbers of other people from related haplogroups. So not um, L21, but uh, other so-called P312 haplogroups, which are, if you like, siblings to that big L21 clade. And um, these, these are growing rapidly, as, as Alex Williamson extends what he does to other haplogroups. And the 2017 figures are only for the year to date, I think, in September. So there's still a bit of 2017 left. Um, there's, a, there's a sale um, conducted in the summer, and results are still coming through for that. Uh, and there will be a sale at the end of the year, and some of those results will be out by Christmas. So I'd expect 2017 to show some, some rapid increase. So in general, there's been fairly steady traffic, I think, with a big Y across the years, but a gradual and accelerating increase in people taking the test up. So it's been a success in a popular test. I'm assuming this is some kind of proxy for the way in which um, big Y generally has been taken up. Now, um, the, the, big, the other big R haplogroup group, U106, has this year joined Alex Williamson in creating their own version of the big tree, and they have just about a thousand results displaying on that already. I think they've more that have um, not yet been put onto the tree. So clearly there's an appetite for taking the test, and there's an appetite for having the data analyzed by others who can build this into useful information trees. That's one of the themes I'll talk about. So we're going to talk about the um, SNP2 value. And a lot of the talk before the big Y started was in terms of terminal SNPs. People want to know, what is my terminal SNP? In general, this would mean something that probably occurred in an ancestor who lived in the Neolithic, um, certainly usually before um, AD, the AD era begins. Um, in other words, not something that will help you with genealogy, but something that will give you some sense of how rooted you are in what was called deep ancestry. And uh, I think when the, the big Y first began, I think many people assumed that's what SNP testing would carry on doing. Just on a few more of these and branch a bit more finely. Um, and certainly produce trees in which at each branching point would be a nice SNP, sitting by itself as a SNP for that branch. That wasn't how it turned out. It soon became clear in the first results that there was an enormous tidal wave of SNPs about to hit the uh, project administrators who had been collecting this data and manually processing it into something meaningful. And this, was, this will turn the, the SNP tsunami was coined by somebody, not sure who, but it spread in a very widespread term, very appropriate. We've got a few um, examples here of how it works. These, these trees are being designed by Mike Walsh, who many of you may have come across, who is a very active administrator in um, the R1B couple of groups in many of the projects under R1B. And um, he, for years, has tried to design trees to show how the, the key SNPs in R1B relate to each other. This is Mike's tree from September 2013, so just before the announcement of the, uh, the big wine. And within a few months, um, this essentially is, is, all, is all of R1B back to M269, not all of R1B, but the most common um, branch of R1B. Um, M269 would be something like 5,000 or more years old, actually. So this is covering a huge time depth. And these ones down the bottom are probably not getting very near to us in history either. Then within a few months, Mike is changing the design of the tree and um, trying to get more SNPs on. So this is one of the first results uh, coming through from the big Y in May 2014. And to squeeze more in, um, he's redesigned the tree like this. He's still got, he's now just L21 by the way, so he's, he's come down the halfway tree, which is just one of these. And still having a nice clear design showing what the big branches of L21 are and then what the main sub-branches are. But then, He's having to pack more and more snips on. So this is now um, the last one I saved, actually. And this is from sometime in 2015. And you can see just how packed the space is. And I think I think it's still updating. I think it just can't fit any more on. So um, I think that we probably put uh, new top-line snips in there if they're discovered. But it hasn't got space for all the ones that descend in the low bit. And that, of course, has had various effects, one of which is a kind of fragmentation, because increasingly, people are becoming interested in their bit of the tree. So the whole of deep ancestry, let's understand the whole of L21. It's been replaced by, let's understand the history of A, whatever that is, 4, 3, whatever. And so in other words, focusing in on the part of the tree where you may be located or your project members are located. Um, and it's, it's near in time, but it's a much more fragmentary part of the overall tree. It's the only way you can get things onto uh, 
uh, on the tree diagrams. I've been working on a, a subclade in R1A, and I went through something very similar across 2015 and 16. By the time I reached 2017, I had to make my, um, my, my, my window so enormous um, and still squeeze things in. I began to realize this actually was going to be futile. I need to find some other way to represent this data. There's, there's just so much in it. Yeah, there's an even more recent um, version. It's not more than Um, some of you may also be familiar with another version of the tree. This has been enabled by, um, by the white axis. Essentially, um, if my Walsh is producing the top level trees, what Alex Williamson is doing is producing the trees that take us down to the individual testers. You can see here some fellow here called Cleary. That's me. Um, that's, that's some other Cleary I found somewhere. Um, and we have got tested. Now, what we see here is a quite long chain. There at the top, we've got something called FGC 5494. Again, in this business, you have to get used to these alphabet spaghetti, strings of letters and, 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 and numbers. Um, but they all represent particular SNPs that have been discovered. And so, on the top there is one of the major branch SNPs under O21. So, that takes you back to my Walsh's tree. And then, of course, these then are all these SNPs discovered in the various big white tests. So, if you, if you start from me and go upwards to FGC 5494, then just drop down one level. All of those were found in me. I was the first tester to have all of those SNPs found. And they're all private SNPs. So when I got my big wide test back in uh, late 2014, um, I had 40 private SNPs. And I thought, hmm, that's very nice, what am I going to do with this? Um, but of course, the thing is, I had to wait for the testers, find more testers, wait for others. So again, developing some structure. So that well, thing at the top, you see Y15901? Okay, it's very really comprehensible. But that was one of my private SNPs. And then eventually, other people, these Crawfords, who emerged out of blue, um, Gorman, who I knew about, um, and it turned out to be much further away from me than we thought we had been on the basis of STRs, and others begin to emerge. Some sort of man called Hui, which was happy Norwegian. So most of these, well, they're, they're Irish. These are Scots Irish, probably. Um, they're probably also Scottish. Um, and this, this man's Norwegian. So this subplate obviously has got some kind of spread. We don't know why or how that happened, but again, there are questions here to ask about directions of travel, where did the SNP originate, probably in Ireland, um, but uh, how did they get to Norway, and so on. But essentially, this is what the, the art of um, SNP testing is all about. Finding those SNPs, finding who else shares them with you, um, and then building structured trees in which the more people share, the higher that must be, it must be older, and the fewer people share the SNP, the more recent it must be, until we come down to this block here, which are all shared by, just so far, two clearies. Um, and they may be clearie SNPs, but probably not, because there's a lot of them here, and that probably goes back a long way, back to the um, early Middle Ages. So I think there may be other people who might come along sharing some of these as well. So what we see here then, it's not that nice little, here's a snip and a branch, here's another snip and a branch, but blocks. So big blocks of snips that all seem to be occupying space on the block. We can take this one here, this big one, with Y9089 on the top, and why is that there on top? Well, only because it happens to be the one with the lowest position number on the Y chromosome map. So therefore, it's stuck at the top, um, we don't know if it's the oldest, we don't know which of those are the oldest. We do know now, that these are less old than those, and that those are less old than the ones at the top. So by finding new tests, we can split the blocks and begin to build a structure into the tree. The block splitting is, is largely what the game is about at the moment. Finding people who will test, who might split the block, maybe because they're STRs, suggest they're a bit like you, but not that close to be a close cousin, and therefore they might be somebody who could um, split the block for you. Um, James Irvin, I think tomorrow, will tell you about the split packs. Uh, which I'm not going to go into today as a tool for working on this kind of thing. So, this is whenever I go here, it starts beeping. Um, so then, does this give some challenges um, and some goals? So it creates a goal of taking these blocks and trying to split them um, to get a more and more structured tree. Um, and ultimately also to hang one's genealogy off the bottom. So, we're just, stuck. we're just beginning to do that here with um, these two clearies. We know we're related, we just don't know how we're related, so the, the common ancestor is a bit before the, uh, the loss of uh, genealogical records in Ireland, but makes it possible to work out 
what the precise relationship is. Um, but we're more to the stage where we can start hanging genealogy off the bottom of the tree here. Well, that's what we're using this to help. So, now let's go talk about the nature of SNPs themselves, because one of the things that soon became very clear was just because something was called as a variant or a SNP, or even had a name, it didn't necessarily mean it really was useful for this kind of tree building exercise. And it soon became clear that many so called named SNPs, named SNPs from earlier research before the Big Y were just not that useful when it came to uh, trying to validate trees. So the goal then becomes to find those SNPs which are useful, and I've got a big word here for you now, which are consistent phylogenetically. This just means in tree building, in building out that ordered tree. Um, and some SNPs, <coughs> they come and they go, or they seem to be spread all over the place um, in an inconsistent way. It's not quite clear whether that's the fault of the test or something in the nature of those SNPs. But of course, what we're trying to do is identify those which are useful. And therefore, when you get the results, you have to, get to start asking questions about the, um, the variant calls, the, the new SNPs, the results says that you have. You need to ask questions such as, is this new SNP actually useful for a tree, tree building process? Um, and can it also be tested reliably on another platform? So Big Y itself is a good test, but there is some degree of false negative and false positive. So once you find a new SNP that could be useful or important for building a branch, you want to know if that can be tested across other platforms. So we've got a couple of clips here. I can look at some of the tools we can use in answering these questions. So first of all, if you want to find out how reliable a, a new a name SNP you have is, you can use the Y full tree. I'm just going to play this here. And, uh, just talk through as it goes. If it does. <coughs> oh well. Um, maybe if we defeated the ability of the projector. You can see the. The uh, C is playing, but it's not playing. Well. There's no audio, it's just an um, image. Yeah, the image is uh, playing. Yes, it is. Thank you, Marcia. Let's see if this one will work. No. I think, um, okay, what, what I was going to do, since we can't get him to the. It's not playing this one, either, actually. I think it's just problems here. Um, I think the, what I was trying to do is we can't get into the internet. I was trying to go through a process by which you can validate SNPs um, by showing screenshots when we recorded earlier. And unfortunately, the images aren't showing. So we've got the still, the beautiful still image of the moon here, but uh, everything I recorded is actually not coming up. So I'll, this time is short, let's jump over this very quickly. What I was showing was two things. First of all, if you um, are familiar with the Wi-Fi, you can use their tree to search um, any SNP name. So it's a search box in the Wi-Fi tree, type in the SNP name, and search, and it will come up um, how many times they have this in their database, and which haplogroups groups you can find that in. And you can see straight away, if there's one, it's perfect. You have a unique SNP there's probably going to be a good branch marker. If you have multiple hits and many SNPs will come up like this, then you will have something that's not very useful for building out a tree. And in between, you may have something that might come up three, four times, again, different haplogroups. groups. SNPs will repeat. There are only uh, 57 million positions on the Y chromosome, and there are three billion men in the world. So clearly, some SNPs will be shared. Um, and will occur multiple times. How many times is a question we're not quite sure about yet. But the, the Wi-Fi tree gives you a means for um, testing whether anything can be, uh, whether the SNP is actually valid or not. Um, what I'll do then, skip over this part, um, and go, go back to blah, blah, blah. Um, and uh, what does it all mean then? What has the SNP to NAMI done for research? Well, I think it's shown us that um, we always knew that STRs were 
probabilistic, and I think it's actually challenged some of the models of trees that are built on the basis of STRs. And in particular, with STRs, we can't see back mutations. So we know they've got them down, we can't see how many times an STR may have got them down. So therefore, we're probably not getting enough data to go back over several hundred years. They're probably okay for the last 200 years or so. Um, but once you go back to the Middle Ages, they're not going to help you build a very reliable tree. Um, SNPs are far more reliable, but also what SNPs will do is lead us towards building trees as the goal of research, rather than building matching tables and working up the probability of who uh, you may be matched to and what that means. Building trees, like the Alex Williamson tree, is now what it's about if we're going to do wild research. Um, and talking trees, I'm going to talk now about the change that Family Tree DNA has done to make their own uh, services a bit more useful than they were before. So first of all, the best thing Family Tree DNA have done in the past year is they have updated and upgraded their Hackle Tree. And they've appointed somebody who uh, oversees it, manages quality control, uh, receives submissions of new SNPs from uh, project administrators, vets them to make sure that they're good, and then builds them onto the tree. And a little clip here of the growing Hackle Tree we see here lots of SNPs, and here's a big block where all these SNPs are equivalent because no one's split that block yet. And um, there are many others who are using this kind of data to build uh, what they call mutation history trees. So say very briefly, Morris was uh, speaking about this yesterday, I think, and Dave Vance will be speaking a bit later in the day about his approach to building mutation history trees. So do come and hear that talk. Available. And James Irvin will speak tomorrow about his own approach to white chromosome research uh, and how to use SNPs and SNP testing um, in a surname project. When we look at the family tree DNA tree, um, tree then, if you test um, the Y, um, then you will get this little button on your um, DNA site, which is your terminal SNP according to their current calculation of it. If you click on that, it will take you to the place in the haplotype tree where that terminal SNP can be found. It's here. There's one more underneath that apparently this tester hasn't got, um, but all the ones in green above, it will have. So we now see that structured order tree. And it's a different tree to the Alex Williamson one with the vertical lines. This one is actually a horizontal tree designed to find a location. What you can do, it's kind of a bit tricky to read actually, what you can do is jump across the highest level, go upwards, and eventually you'll find the, the ancient um, SNPs. In this case, you go back, back eventually to M459 and R1A. And, and SDDNA being very, very proactive in building the tree. This is good because it means that new testers will then get terminal SNPs which are further and further down the tree. But it does need project administrators to be proactive in sending the data. What kind of data can they send? They must send in positive evidence of who has the SNP, um, hopefully arranged in a kind of branch plus negative evidence of who, of who does not have the SNP um, in neighboring branches. So you can see exactly where the limits of the SNP are. And a little graphic to show how this works. Um, here we have a descendant from a mythical ancestor called John Doe, and all these people are DNA tested. Um, so number one to number 11. And some of them will have this SNP here marked by A, which looks quite nice, a range of branch here. Maybe it's a SNP that appeared about here, we don't have enough data yet because we need to know the negatives. And so with these two negatives in the next nearest branches, we now know we can limit the position of A to around here. On the other hand, if you don't have those negatives, you can't make that firm judgment. So here again we have four people with uh, C's, and it looks like you've got a nice consistent branch round about here, maybe that's where C appears in this tree, but the two on top are no call. NC means no call, no result at that position. And therefore we can't be sure that C belongs here, because it could belong here, and it could belong here. So what do you have to do if you want to declare this SNP and get it on the tree, is get those negative tests. Either through a big Y, but maybe a big Y doesn't read that position, or alternatively through doing single SNP Sanger testing, uh, in selected people who fit down these branches so you can zero in and pinpoint exactly where a SNP is. So we're going to move on to the final stage now. Um, just check on the 
over time, to talk about the, the new tools recently released uh, by Family Tree DNA for the Y. The Apple Tree has been um, enhanced over the past year or so, and I think that is the, the best thing Family Tree DNA have done uh, for the Big Y. The, the new tools are an interesting step in the right direction. Now, a year ago, uh, there was a lot of talk about the new Big Y. Uh, it was taken 12 months for it to appear, um, and I speculated what these changes may be. Um, would they know to dynamic, generate a tree dynamically uh, from test results? No, they're not doing that. They're moving that direction, but at the moment they still prefer manual checking and submissions. Um, other people like Wifel do have a dynamic tree, but they have a small database. So family trees in a have all the big white tests, so ultimately any tree can be verified by the data they hold. Um, I, I thought we, we, we actually knew they were going to convert at some stage to the much more accurate uh, reference sequence of the human genome, now known as HG38. And those of you who've done the big while probably have emails about this. The change is currently in progress. I believe about 30% of existing test results have been changed, uh, with the rest to be done over the next two weeks. Um, we wondered if they would change the regions of the Y to target more SNPs known to be in other areas. No, they're not doing this. The, the test is still the same, um, targeting the same areas. So the analysis tool has changed, the test is the same. Um, we wonder if they might have tests with longer read lengths. This probably will come uh, at some stage, but not just yet, so we're still working with the, the same roughly 150 base pair read lengths. Um, this means essentially you've got shorter bits of the chromosome to reassemble like a jigsaw into a bigger picture. So the longer the, the bits you read and go, the easier that jigsaw becomes. Imagine being in school, you've got those nice you know, starter jigsaws with four or five um, pieces, which, you know, which, which toddlers use. You compare that with the tiny pieces you've got to assemble in a jigsaw you do, and you probably use a picture. I don't know if you do jigsaws, by the way, but if you do, you probably use a picture to guide you in building that jigsaw up. That's how the, um, the, the human genome reference system works in building up this jigsaw of uh, Y chromosome reads. Um, we were wondering if there would be better results, presentation tools, because family tree DNA's presentation tools were quite poor, really, originally. Um, and this is partially the case. Um, there has been some improvement. And, of course, we wanted all of this to be at the same cost or less. And actually, in general, this is the case, because uh, family tree DNA has had multiple sales this year, in which you can buy the uh, big Y for lower and lower prices. Effectively, if you're ready, ready to wait for the sales, the effective cost of the big Y is coming down. There's usually one more at the year's end, by the way. So let's look at um, the tools then. This is what actually has been done as of uh, October 2017. They have converted to HG38. They've introduced a new matching system, um, a sort of matching, essentially arranging your matches according to shared branches, which sounds like common sense, and it is actually potentially a very powerful and useful thing. Um, they've already removed a lot of unreliable name snips on database, which no longer confuse uh, the issue. And they've created a, a browser, a graphical browser, for the white, white chromosome, so you can see the reads that a SNP has been discovered within. And we'll see these in a moment. Um, they are also, this is actually very useful for administrators, they are in, increasing the amount of data in their um, raw data files, known as a VCF. And these are the files that Alex Williamson and others base their tree upon. So giving them more data to work with, will probably help them to build better and more accurate trees. Um, and they're also changing the threshold in how they'll call the SNP. Essentially, the old raw data files, the uh, position had to be read at least 10 times before they would enter it into their raw data. In fact, there were many positions read fewer times than that. And the general consensus around, some may dispute this, but the general consensus that if you find something called as a SNP at least four times, you're probably going to get something there that's worth looking at. So it seems that they're lowering their threshold to for the new VCF file to four rather than uh, ten. Again, that might be a bit baffling for some of you, um, but it does matter if you do do a big white test. You must download your raw data and then find something that can help you analyze it. And the improvements in the data here will help to produce better analysis. Now, we may have time to get through all of this, but um, look at some of the most important changes. First of all, the HG38 conversion. This isn't as baffling as it sounds. 
Uh, imagine you've got a, a map, the real world, and survey maps in imperial measures, so your coordinates are all in, in miles, and you want to convert it to a metric measure, so it'll all be in kilometers and meters instead. That essentially is, what, is what's happening here. The map of the Y chromosome is basically a long line, sort of one at one end, and work up to 57 million at the other end, uh, and each position has a number in sequence, more or less, is just being replaced by another one that's better designed. And the little map here, the contigs, the contiguous sequences that exist in the old system, most of them just transfer across. And then new ones get stuck in between because they've found more sequences or map them more accurately. So there'll be some position numbers uh, changing. And additionally, um, some sequences that were thought to be on the Y chromosome in the previous build are actually found to be on the X chromosome or other chromosomes, so they've been taken out. And the net effect is that your 59 million positions on the Y chromosome in the old build has now become about 57 million in the new build. And this means that all the position numbers, if you've looked at them, will be different. Most of them, about 2 million less, especially in the higher ranges. A little example here. This is one of the SNPs we looked at in the, in the previous tree, Y609. Top, we have the old build in HG19, 22 million and something, and down below that you have the new reference sequence number, 19 million and something, uh, about 2 million lines. What does this mean? Not a lot, it just means that the new reference sequence is more accurate, and therefore more accurate SNP calls can be made. A few SNPs might vanish if they're just fluff and rubbish, they've gone, or if they're on other chromosomes, they've gone, but the majority have been mapped across and um, it's possible now to get more, um, more reliable results. Um, there's no change in the particular rotation, that's still a G to an A. There is no change in SNP names. Uh, all these wonderful L21, L448, all these numbers, um, they remain the same, just that their underlying position number will change. But if you know a SNP name, there's no difference. That doesn't change. Um, administrators would need to update their SNP catalogs to reflect the new numbers. That actually isn't very hard. There are lots of useful online conversion programs that will batch convert a whole range of numbers. You can copy and paste into, into the converters and then copy and paste back. So it's not actually a very difficult thing. We just need to get used to using them. And um, some analysts are yet to announce when they will change. No names mentioned. So moving on then um, to the second big change, the assortative matching. This, I think, is potentially very, very interesting. We've been calling this for a long time. Um, what it essentially means is you get a little chunk of the Hackler tree on your matches page. And it tells you how many matches you have at your terminal SNP level and how many in the branches above that. And it gives you four branches above. And see, this person, they've been running the test very quickly. They already have up to 13 matches at this level. And this was great. When I, when I first saw this, I thought, wow, this looks really impressive. Um, it's, there are problems, however, um, and the question is, one of the big problems is, what levels do we choose here? So the moment they're going for just the four above your terminal, and this actually can create some anomalies. Um, this person here, for example, has got no matches, he's been posting on uh, various lists about this, partly because his matches test have not been converted yet, but also because his uh, upper level here stops a bit lower than the previous one. The reason is, he's, he's got, gone further down his tree. So the further you go down your tree, you're still only going to get four. So this person, very, very similar. Oh, that's the one we just looked at, actually. And, uh, oh no, no, the team we just looked at has got more matches, whereas this person has got fewer. Yet that YP984 is underneath the YP355. So this person should be matching some of the people who are matching this person. And the reason is this, a little um, simplified tree here, or the subtype, you can see that um, the first person is the one here with the red, and again, there's a term in the SNP, and then one, two, three, four, and that's where he stops. Then the second one is this person here in blue, that's his terminal, and again, one, two, three, four, that's where he stops. And then the third one was this person here who hasn't gone as far down the tree as he has, so he stops here, that's now officially his terminal, and one, two, three, four takes him higher up. And this means that these two people should be matches, they'll see each other, but this person won't see some of the people 
that this person will. And I think it's actually an anomalous. Um, this person here will go way back up above one two, three, five, five, back into ancient Scandinavian snips, and we'll see a lot more matches, therefore, um, from other um, members of the Big L448. Some play, including many Scots from the Western Isles, many Norwegians and Swedes, um, and so the other testers are missing this. Now, maybe the testers aren't too bothered. I mean, most testers would not know about their genealogy, which you do. And therefore, what you want to know is, who's close to me? Who do I need to approach because they may share a common genealogy with me in a historical period? It does create a problem. It does create a problem for the... Um, Click word in again. Good word. Okay. It does create a problem for project administrators. If you want to build a tree up, and you have this person in your um, in your tree, they're doing very well in getting this far. But in a sense, their reward is not to see as much data, as much matching data as others. And if you're working through that person's results, you won't see them either. So I think we need to consider how the sort of matching should be built and how it might be mapped onto the um, the apple tree to make it truly useful. But a great step in the right direction, I think, has been a huge step forward. Um, now, the, the, the white chromosome browser has been added um, this time, a bit of a surprise. I don't think many of us were expecting it to come. Um, and it's, it's very pretty, it's very nice and colourful. Um, unfortunately, I think it's very limited in what it, uh, it offers. It will allow you to see a snip. And essentially, these lines are reads. These are all the 150 base pair long reads, chunks of your uh, Y chromosome, which are being reassembled into the jigsaw by overlapping them to get a, a longer read across this full set of overlapping short reads. And of course, here we have a nice snip all the way down. Clearly, every single read is finding this one to be a variant. And therefore, that's probably a good snip. Um, we get a little bit of extra data as well. Um, this is from YP355, which is a, a known SNP. It's of Scandinavian origin and it's probably about 2,600 years old, plus around a few centuries. And um, again, it looks very consistent. There's one read here that doesn't have it, but that's not a problem because if at least 90% of your reads are showing the variant, that's probably all right. Um, and Ramachuja may have given us some extra information here. If you click on any of these A's, it will tell you that it gives you the position. Derived means mutated. Um, there is the actual mutation. And confidence 99.999999999% That's quite nice. Um, I don't have quite the same confidence myself. The problem is, the, this confidence rating turns out to be of each individual read. So as you click it up and down, you'll get different confidence ratings. What we don't have is some nice summary data about this particular variant. Now, it's modeled on a um, utility online called IGV, Integrative Genome Viewer, which does this kind of thing, but it's much more flexible. So allows you to zoom in, zoom out. You can pull right out and see the whole pattern of the reads and where they're clustering. Zoom right in and look more closely at them. But even more usefully is if you click at the top on the reference sequence, it'll then tell you how many reads there are below that and how many of those are of the, uh, of, of the call. So what percentage you get of the, uh, of the uh, mutation. And with this one, you have to count. And you have to scroll down, which you can do, and count all the way down, and then if you go back, go back upwards and count the ones that haven't mutated, and you can work it out for yourself. But it would be a lot more useful if this kind of data was included. Now the problem is, this is the data that is given in your raw result BAM file. And the BAM file is a very large file, which must be generated by family tree DNA. And I think they don't really want to generate more than they need to. But I would say that all big white testers get your BAM file. You still need it. Because at the moment, this very nice graphical browser gives us something. We can look at our SNPs and see what they look like. It's not really telling us what we need to know about them, uh, how reliable they are um, as a whole, um, and some kind of overall quality control um, check for um, for a SNP. Now, this is the kind of thing that third party analysts like Wifel.com or Full Genomes Core will still do for you. So I still say, good as, as this is, good as the improvements have been, 
We've not yet gone far enough. We need some enhancement, development of different really useful tools. So at the moment, big white testers still need to get their raw data, and I would still recommend going to third-party analysts to get the full picture. Got a few more examples here. Um, this is one that clearly probably is not a very good SNP, because you have a lot of low-quality reads, that's why they're like faded looking, um, surrounding the G, there's lots of G calls there, uh, on low quality SNPs. If you click up and down here, you get a much lower confidence rating. Um, and probably looking at this, we'd say eyeballing is not going to be very good, but we need something more um, rigorous and uh, scientific, really, to judge whether or not this is going to be a useful call. So I think the Chrome and browser is going to have rather limited use. A few more examples. Um, this one is a Chrome and browser showing this SNP, but basically you click on the call in the person's results, and you see this. So this is given as an unnamed private SNP in this person's results. Great, but what's that? That's not called. That's not mentioned in the list of results. What's that? And if you click here again, you see you're getting confidence 80 percent. So you think maybe that's just not very good, but actually so is that if you click on that. So they're all getting the same confidence ratings because they're the confidence ratings of the horizontal lines. Reads. We want to know more about these vertical lines. What are they adding up to? Um, and at least with this particular view, we can see that the, uh, there are more SNPs to investigate. We can go to other tools, put the numbers, find out more about them, see if they're known already, see if they look like they'd be useful. But at the moment, um, the, the browser itself is not telling us what we need to know about them. Also, it's very limited. We can scroll to and fro, it covers about 300 positions. But you can't go looking at other parts of the browser. So we'd like to, be able to keep sliding through, hunting for more SNPs that haven't been called. But we can't do that. You can only click on the ones that have been called. Then you get this very limited view. Um, it might tell you something, but ultimately won't let you go searching for other things not listed, unless you're lucky enough to see them on the view of the browser. So I think it's a useful idea. But it's modeled on, as I said, um, a service provided um, elsewhere. But it doesn't go really far enough in spying as we use the information. Um, I won't play my video because it doesn't work. Um, it's just a summary word of saying, essentially, um, limitations of the chromosome browser. Um, and uh, one more thing, that this, this hasn't been a change. There's been no change in the way in which family tree DNA present the results. So we still get an alphabetical, alphabetical list of known SNPs. You can browse them down or search, but it's not very um, directly user-friendly. And I think this contrasts um, rather with the one that uh, wifold.com produced, which is actually arranged in the order of the tree. So as you, at the top are the ones that are nearer to your terminal position. As you go down and get further and further going up the tree, there's some meaning, meaning in the way in which they're arranged. You know, the, the lower down you go, the, the older those snips are. It's actually quite useful, I think. And it could be adopted, I think, as a means for arranging snips by the DNA as well. Um, as I just said, I, we, I recommend people still get their, their BAM files. Um, anybody who's done a test already uh, apparently will have their BAM file realigned to the new reference sequence. Um, but we don't know at the moment whether that will be done automatically or whether we need to request it. We may need to contact the company to say, please realign my BAM. It's actually a huge job with a lot of processing power required. So I think they'll probably just do it on a case by case basis, but I would recommend um, doing that. I would still recommend sending the BAM files to third-party analysts at the moment because good as these changes are, they're not yet really filling the gap. So just to sum up then, I've looked at the tree-building approach to using SNPs for researching surnames or the tone line using the Y chromosome. Um, I've talked about how I think that SNP sequencing is the only way to do this today. STRs play a role, but they're secondary now to SNP sequencing. And um, we need to find ways of assessing the SNPs we find to see whether they're reliable enough to go into a robust tree. Um, and the testers should still download their raw data, and there's still a role of the third party analysts to help us extract more value from that data. I'd like to end by thanking a few people here who've given help in the preparation of the talk, either, with, either knowingly or, or unknowingly. Um, so thank you very much. I think Maurice is hovering to uh, put the guillotine down, so I will uh, stop now and um, make some questions this time. Thank you, thank you John. Thank you. Thank you.
time for a few questions. Any questions for John? Jim Foley here in front. One, one quick one and one little more detail. Will we need to resubmit the new bound files to Y4 or other third party groups? Y4 haven't actually told us what they're doing yet. Um, they haven't, they're haven't. they now offering HG38 positions if you click with the SIP data. They haven't converted over. And I think they're probably discussing what they can do. They also depend on uh, processing power, which they can let them buy and pay for. So I don't know if they can reprocess all the bound files for free. They're probably seeing what they can do. The other one is on your big tree. You had two clearings of Mormon, OI, and then thousand genomes above it. My closest match is thousand genomes. Is there a way to access that to then transfer it to family tree DNA and use the data from the thousand genomes person? Uh, Mark, um, Alex Williams has that. If you, if you click on the thousand genomes person, you will see the private SNPs that he's extracted from that uh, thousand genomes bound file. Um, you can't get data on the, the people because that was a medical. Research projects, all confidential. Uh, my first match was also a thousand genomes person. Um, but you can get snips at least from the tree. But can you actually transfer that data into your family tree and, and have it be a transfer file? Um, there's no, you can't transfer things into family tree DNA. The, the, the results are simply, this is your result from your um, bound file. You can transfer it to others. And Alex Williamson and Wifle.com and probably FTC all use the thousand genomes data. Question here from Jerry Corcoran. So John, great presentation. So the SNP tsunami is morphing into the acronym apocalypse. Right? Yes. Um, when is technology going to disappear and this will become easy for me? I'm, I'm thinking Alex Williamson's uh, tree is brilliant. It's very easy to understand, but it's a batch, long batch process. Mm. Is there any way we can get FTDNA to real time generate those types of trees, maybe incorporate surname matching, maybe incorporate district matching, you know, geographic matching and so on. So on. I don't know if that FTDNA are going to incorporate those extra features, but I think they are trying to find ways to generate trees automatically. Uh, I think there are rumors that they're working on it, um, but they're keeping stone as well. So I don't know how soon it's going to happen, but we know they have a database. We know wifle.com can do it. The problem is, if you generate a tree dynamically and automatically, then you're dependent on the on the inputs. You're dependent on how you describe that tree. Um, whereas with manual control, you've got someone checking and saying, that's not good. And at least there's some kind of control there. So I don't know whether we can move to that. Um, you know more than me being the data analyst, I think. Uh, I'm just meant to use it. Here. Last question over here. Thank you very much, John. It's very interesting talk. You've said, obviously, that SDRs have gone as far as they can go. And, and clearly, Big Y has sort of opened the lid off the, the, the SNP Pandora's box. There's a big, you know, a big amount of information that has been assembled on historic SDR testing. And lots of those people may or may not go forward to Big Y testing. What's your current view on identifying from, SD, from historic SDR tests who might be best approach to, to, to go for big Y testing? Well, I certainly wouldn't say STRs have no use at all. Uh, I think they do. What, what's doing really was we can't rely upon them for building trees. But I think STRs can be very, very useful, as you say, in identifying who may be um, related to you at the right kind of uh, distance to make a big Y test worth doing. You don't want to do big Y tests if you are very close to you because you'll get the same results. You don't want to do one that, that are very, very far away. So the STRs can help you find those uh, people with good testing candidates. Yeah, and in terms of surname projects, I usually test the people that are most distant to each other within a particular SDR group within the project. And that's a relatively good way of trying to triangulate on what your hope is, the most distant common ancestor to that particular genetic group. Well, we have to leave it there, but listen, John, thanks very much for a wonderful explanation of what's happening. John Cleary.